everyone and welcome. My name is Dr. Kelly Harding and I'm the host of today's webinar. I am the Director of Research Administration and a Research Associate with CANFAST. Um, my own personal background is in human development, interdisciplinary health and health service delivery, particularly in rural and northern communities. Um, I've worked in the field of FASD since 2010 and, I'm and am involved in a diverse number of research projects in the areas of FASD prevention and women's health, FASD assessment and diagnosis, family well-being, mental health, and human rights. Um, and I'm also joining you today as the organizer of CANFAS trainee program, and so I'm so excited to be here and I'm so excited for our first group of trainees um, to be able to present to you today. An important step in reconciliation is the acknowledgement of traditional treaty lands and recognition for the people of the territory. The Canada FASD Research Network recognizes the historical significance and contributions of Indigenous peoples and their cultures and understands the important role that the Indigenous community plays today and in the future. We acknowledge that we live, work, and meet on traditional territories across Canada of many of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. And I personally wish to acknowledge that the land on which I gather and work is in Robinson Huron Treaty Territory and the traditional territory of the Atika Mekshang Anishinaabek. So just a few housekeeping items before we get going today. In an effort to make our webinars as inclusive as possible, we have enabled the closed captioning feature for those who wish to use it. So at the bottom of your screen, there's a live transcription button. You may choose to have subtitles on the screen or have a full transcript that gives you the extra detail of which panelist is speaking. We will also be recording this presentation and it will be available on our CANFAS YouTube channel um, shortly following the webinar. And this Zoom webinar today has the question and answer function enabled, so participants can ask questions and upvote the questions so that the most common ones come to the top. There will be a short period of time after each individual presentation to have the speakers answer a few questions that are put forth. Um, and then we'll also have time again at the end of the webinar for additional questions for the entire panel today. Um, and so please note who your questions are directed towards for that uh, component. So a bit of an introduction of our trainee program. Um, so as I mentioned, today's webinar is the first in a series featuring our CANFAS trainees, the second of which will be taking place next Friday on June 3rd at, all, at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. And so this year, CANFAS launched and piloted this exciting new program for students and early career researchers and professionals in Canada who are working in the field of FASD. So beginning in January 2022, eight trainees were invited to take part in this pilot program and nominated by our CANFAS research leads and associates, the trainees represent a pan-Canadian group of interested students and research support staff from a wide range of disciplines and levels of training. The goals of this program are to build research capacity in the field of FASD, foster mentorship, networking, and collaboration among the trainees and leading Canadian researchers, and to encourage the next generation of up-and-coming FASD researchers. So as part of this program, our trainees have the opportunity to profile their work to the CANFAS network through things like our blog, um, newsletter updates, and public presentation, including today's webinar. So given that the trainees are a diverse group of researchers, you're going to hear about a variety of projects that use different methodologies and different approaches and also are in various stages of completion. So today you will hear from four of our trainees on a wide range of topics, including psychologists' knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and teaching practices regarding FASD, highlights of FASD prevention research published in 2021 and the broad implications of this research, FASD and socially inappropriate sexual behavior, and strengths and protective factors in justice-involved youth with FASD. So today, Devin is our first presenter. Devin is an incoming first-year doctoral student in school and clinical child psychology at the University of Alberta. She has spent several years researching health outcomes in children and has spent her graduate career researching various facets of FASD. As a caregiver of a high support needs sibling, Devin is interested in learning ways to support caregivers and healthcare providers with strength-based intervention strategies and information about FASD. Devin's presentation is titled, From Training to Professional Practice, Do Faculty of Professional Psychology Programs Feel Prepared to Teach Student Clinicians About FASD? Although professional learning is lifelong, most psychologists establish foundational beliefs, attitudes, and perceptions in their graduate programs, eventually permeating clinical practice. 
faculty members of Canadian professional psychology programs were sent a survey exploring knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and teaching practices regarding FA FASD. And so preliminary results will be shared in this webinar. So with that, we will hear from Devin. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna share my screen here. And there we go. Okay, well, thank you so much for that introduction. So again, hi everybody, thank you for coming today. My name is Devin and um, like Kelly said, I am a graduate student at U of A. I live in Edmonton, Alberta, which is on Treaty 6 territory. And today I'll be sharing with you some of the preliminary data from my master's thesis, where I looked into the knowledge, attitudes, and practices of faculty members of professional psychology programs across Canada. So a little background, as you might know, FASD is a whole body diagnosis that requires special considerations for diagnosis, assessment, and intervention. A recent survey found that clinicians feel underprepared to provide services to individuals with FASD. And overall, most clinicians feel that they need more training and support to increase their competency in this area. So based on that, it's possible to think that clinicians are not thoroughly trained on FASD during their graduate training and enter the field feeling unprepared. Clinical training for psychologists typically includes a master's and doctorate degrees. So between the two to eight years that they take in training, it seems reasonable to expect that students might develop some sort of competency in FASD along with other mental disorders. The reason why we care so much about clinician training is because training experiences relate directly to future practices. So for example, here is a model based off of educational theories where students are given various ways to learn new information, and then they have learning experiences and they develop their knowledge and attitudes and practices throughout this training and experiences. They also learn and model um, the knowledge, attitudes and practices from their trainers, or in this case, faculty members. Now, everything that's learned in professional school leads to ideally the student being able to um, use the best evidence-based practices with their patients or clients. And then finally, um, that leads to improved um, patient outcomes. Without FASD related learning experiences, clinicians are left winging it or unable to provide services for all of this population, which can be a problem when we also start thinking about rural or remote access to mental health services. Basically, clinicians who receive adequate training on FASD are better equipped to provide evidence-based care to their patients, and these clinicians also have higher self-efficacy or self-confidence to carry out their work. So when I was talking about my thesis to a faculty member, they mentioned something about when designing a course with limited resources like time, an educator has to decide which topics students must learn and then balance it with topics that would be nice for them to learn. And currently, FASD is not a must learn topic for students. And through my research, I want to convince you why it's important and why it should be um, a must learn topic and explore some of the reasons of maybe why it's not consistently a must learn topic. So again, the purpose of this research was to find out why FASD is not consistently a must learn topic. And we did this by identifying any knowledge gaps or misconceptions about FASD, common attitudes about FASD, both positive and negative, and some of the barriers that faculty members might experience that prevent them from teaching F about FASD. We also wanted to explore the relationship between teaching practices and individual knowledge and attitude to further understand why FASD is not that must learn topic. So for my thesis, I designed a knowledge attitudes and practices survey or a CAP survey and based off pre um, it was based off of previous research and I adapted it to be used within the context of professional psychology. The survey was also used, um, it was reviewed and edited by two FASD experts to make sure that it was accurate and relevant. Um, the survey was distributed online to professional psychology programs across Canada, 
and the survey was sent to administrative staff to be forwarded to faculty. And there were actually a lot of challenges with this. Um, not only was I recruiting during COVID and during a time where universities were pivoting back and forth between online and in-person. So out of the 64 professional psychology programs across Canada, only eight of them confirmed that the survey was forwarded to faculty. So 23 people started the survey and only 11 completed it. So the data that I present today is from those 11 completed surveys. So despite having 11 participants and without going into too much detail, overall, the sample was quite diverse. We had almost an equal number of participants in early career, then middle, and then a couple in their late career. And 100% of them were registered psychologists and five of them maintain a clinical practice outside of their teaching career. And then we also had a variation of program specialties. So some of them taught in different um, specialties as well. So we had some cl mostly clinical psychology, some counseling school, and then one neuropsychology. So the knowledge domain of this survey focused on measuring participants' knowledge on FASD. So first I asked participants how many standard drinks would be safe to consume during pregnancy, and 10 out of 11 participants answered zero throughout all trimesters. Next, participants completed true-false questions about prevalence rates and some common misconceptions about FASD. The participants mostly answered correctly, and nearly all participants were in agreement. So, for example, when I asked them, you can, or the statement was, you can identify a client with FASD by just looking at them, 100% of them said false, which is great. And the only time there was significant variation was when they were asked whether FASD was the most prevalent neurodevelopmental disorder in Canada. Only 45% of them answered true. So next, I listed 24 outcomes and features of FASD and asked participants how often these features are seen within cases and their clients. And out of these tw those 24, I chose these ones to present. The bars aren't necessarily um, directionality, but it more so represents accuracy in the survey responses. So the general trend was that participants had difficulties identifying uh, frequency of features. Some participants were more likely to overestimate the frequency or how often these outcomes occur in clients with FASD. So some of the examples of um, participants overestimating how frequent they um, outcomes are include facial differences, oppositional defiant disorder, and substance use disorders. And then sometimes participants underestimated how often these outcomes occur. Um, and those ones were like suicide attempts, anxiety, and sensory difficulties. In the attitude domain, I measured or asked questions about potential attitudes that could impact teaching practices. And then we also asked about um, their self-efficacy or their confidence or self-perception of how prepared they feel to teach clinicians about FASD and also provide services of, um, to individuals and families affected by FASD. And so um, I presented three statements to participants and the first one was, I don't have enough time to teach F about FASD. And most of them disagreed um, with some in agreement. Next, all of them agreed in some at some level that FASD is important to teach. And then the last statement about um, an FASD diagnosis may stigmatize an individual or their family. Um, there was a lot of variation, but an equal divide between the agree and disagree. Next, I asked participants how prepared they felt to teach about FASD and to provide services to individuals with FASD. Something that stood out immediately to me was that participants felt that they could support caregivers and, the, and with their children with FASD and then also support students who have clients with FASD. But in every other area, at least half of the participants felt that they were unprepared at some level. So this is more clearly clear here that you can just see how many participants don't feel prepared to train the next generation of clinicians to provide or to provide uh, clinical services to clients with FASD themselves. Within the practices domain, I asked questions about teaching practices. Again, there was a lot of variation, but FASD stood out as something that was not always taught. So when they were asked, I prepare specific coursework on the following disorders, you can see here, there's no orange line that says that they always do. It was mostly skewed towards never or not often um, presenting FASD related course material within their teaching practice. 
To see why that might be, I asked about the barriers that they face when deciding whether FASD is one of those must learn topics. And what these results suggest is that participants are most likely um, or they mostly feel that no one is qualified to actually teach um, FASD content within these programs. And that's not necessarily, it's not that they don't have enough time or whether or not um, the students get experiences in other pieces of their training, but it's that they don't feel that anybody's actually qualified within their department or program. And um, they also agreed that students encounter FASD within their clinical training, but still, for some reason, FASD is not a must learn topic within these training programs. So in conclusion, to varying degrees, people feel that FASD is important to teach, but they just don't feel qualified or equipped to teach FASD. A limitation of this study was definitely the number of participants, but still, it was clear that there is a significant need for a more systematic approach to training FASD-informed scientist practitioners. It's not good enough to wait until um, clinicians are out of school because by that point they are already practicing or might ha have the time or ability or means to attain that professional development. And efforts should be made to make FASD related information more accessible for faculty members of professional psychology programs because we want to train future clinicians in a way that not only makes them feel more competent and able to provide evidence based services, but also that they are have the opportunity to support healthy outcomes and in individuals with FASD and their families. And that was all that I had for you today. So thank you for listening. Well, myself and I'm sure many of the attendees here uh, look forward to the next stages of your work. So thank you very much, Devin. Thank you so much for your time. So our second presenter today is Ella Huber. Ella is a research and knowledge exchange assistant at the Center of Excellence for Women's Health. At the center, Ella's work is focused on FASD prevention and applying a sex and gender based um, analysis to substance use, research and health policy. She also supports the communication and knowledge exchange efforts at the center in efforts to bring knowledge to action. Ella holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology with honors from the University of Victoria. Ella's presentation is titled A Look at the Literature on FASD Prevention in 2021, Prevalence and Influencing Factors of Alcohol Use During Pregnancy. This presentation will focus on the 2021 annual annotated bibliography of articles related to FASD prevention that is conducted by the Prevention Network Action Team of the CANFAS Research Network. The presentation will attend to the annotated bibliography as a whole and how it contributes to policy and practice with specific attention to how research on prevalence and influencing factors of alcohol use during pregnancy can inform FASD prevention efforts. And so with that, we will hear from our second presenter, Ella. Thanks, Kelly. Um, let's just get my slides going here. Okie dokie. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Ella Huber and I'm speaking to you today from the unceded Lekwungen and Wasanic territories. Um, as Kelly mentioned, I'm a research and knowledge exchange assistant at the Center of Excellence for Women's Health, which is a virtual research and knowledge exchange center. So at the center, our work spans a range of topics relating to women's health, um, including alcohol use during pregnancy and how to prevent FASD in a woman-centered, non-stigmatizing and trauma-informed way. We place a strong value on bringing uh, knowledge to action and with funding from CANFAST and the support of CANFAST researchers, one of the ways um, we do this is through an annual annotated bibliography where we compile research published on FASD prevention in a given year. The presentation will provide an overview of the annotated bibliographies as a whole, and then I'll focus on some of the findings from the 2021 annotated bibliography. So first I'll talk a little bit about what the purpose and intention is behind creating these annotated bibliographies, as well as the methodology. And then I'll turn to the 2021 findings, um, and I'll specifically focus on findings related to prevalence and influencing factors of alcohol use during pregnancy, and how this research can inform FASD prevention, but also has uh, some limitations. And then I'll end my presentation with some reflections and some thoughts about how the field is moving forward. 
So why an annotated bibliography? Um, we've been conducting the annotated bibliography since 2013, and they're intended to provide up-to-date evidence to those involved in FASD prevention work. So by, by compiling the research evidence each year, we can identify trends in the research, such as what topics are being investigated, what countries are involved in FASD prevention research, and also um, we can identify the evolution of knowledge um, as new discoveries are made in the field. We can also use this evidence to inform policy and practice efforts, and we can identify gaps in the evidence and see where we need to focus our future research endeavors. So how are they created? Um, each year, it's much the same, but for the 2021 bibliography, we first searched six databases for articles published between January and December 2021 using a list of search terms. And then we screened the articles for eligibility. So we only included articles published in the English language and articles related to prevention of FASD. So anything else about FASD, such as diagnostics or clinical presentation, would get excluded at this point. The articles are then categorized into themes. And then a team of researchers from the Center of Excellence for, Mo for Women's Health and from CANFAS write the annotations based on a rubric. And then finally, um, the annotations are compiled into the bibliography and summarized. And then um, in the past two years, we also summarized the findings into an executive summary. So as mentioned, um, a part of the methodology is to categorize all the articles into themes. And these themes are based off of the four level prevention framework, which was created by the Prevention Network Action Team of CANFAST. So just to walk you through these levels a little bit, um, level one is focused on broader public awareness raising efforts, the promotion of girls and women's health, and is um, also developing community support for FASD prevention. Level two is about discussions or brief interventions with all women of childbearing age about reproductive health, contraception, pregnancy, alcohol use, and related issues. Um, uh, and this is encouraged with uh, support networks as well as healthcare professionals. In level three, the focus is on specialized, holistic, and culturally safe supports and services for pregnant women who have alcohol problems, as well as other health and social concerns. In level four, postpartum supports for mothers and children are the focus, as the postpartum period is an important period for preventing alcohol use in future pregnancies, as well as maintaining any positive health behavior change that was made during pregnancy. Supportive alcohol and child welfare policies are at the center of the framework, as they are key to creating an environment that supports prevention at all four levels. Um, so for the annotated bibliographies, we also categorize articles into two additional themes, one being the prevalence and influences of alcohol use during pregnancy, as well as another category that encapsulates multiple levels of the framework. So articles about stigma or ethical issues um, and systemic approaches to prevention. And each year what we see is that prevalence and influences of alcohol use during pregnancy emerges as a top theme that articles are focused on. And this research can support prevention efforts at all levels of this framework by improving our understanding of risk factors as well as at-risk populations so that prevention efforts can be tailored to need and resources can be appropriately allocated. So in 2021, 99 articles were included from our searches. And this table provides an overview of the number of articles found in each topic area by country. Um, and also to note, there were four papers that were attributed to more than one topic and four papers attributed to more than one country in this table here. So consistent with previous years, um, in 2021, research on FASD prevention was mostly focused on prevalence and influences of alcohol use during pregnancy, as well as level two prevention. And then also consistent with previous years, it was most often generated in the US, Canada, the UK, and Australia. So here are some examples of the prevalence estimates we saw for alcohol use during pregnancy in the 2021 articles. And what I wanna point out is that the prevalence varies quite a lot depending on the population being studied, as well as how alcohol use is being operationalized, measured or detected, um, the time period chosen to study, 
um, as well as the pattern or amount of use being measured, etc. So for example, the finding of 1.1% from the Canadian study on the left here is measuring when alcohol use was identified as a risk factor by a woman's antenatal care provider, while the finding of 11.58% is from a Korean study that measured self-reported alcohol use at least once during a woman's pregnancy. And it's noted in this uh, Korean study that the finding dropped to 1.13% when looking at continued alcohol use through all three trimesters. In the US study that found a prevalence rate of 7.7%, they also found discrepancies by race in terms of who was being screened and counseled about alcohol use during pregnancy. Finally, the finding of 5.3% was detected through a biochemical agent that can detect alcohol in the blood up to two weeks later. And this Dutch study found that most women who tested positive for alcohol did not disclose their alcohol use to their care providers. So the example findings I presented are helpful as they can help us identify at-risk populations of women so that we know where to um, put our prevention efforts and tailor to need. Um, understanding the prevalence of alcohol use during pregnancy is especially helpful for securing funds needed for prevention initiatives by demonstrating need. However, it's also important to remember that alcohol use during pregnancy remains highly stigmatized. And as was demonstrated in the research, many women may not feel safe to disclose their use. Additionally, service providers don't always consistently and compassionately ask women about their alcohol use. Um, and this is also seen in the research. So taken together, it's likely that the prevalence estimates we see in the research are underestimating the true prevalence of alcohol use during pregnancy. An additional challenge is that research is often focused on the prevalence of FASD and less attention is given to the prevalence of alcohol use during pregnancy. So while understanding the prevalence of FASD is important, we do also need to understand the prevalence of alcohol use during pregnancy so that we can create pre prevention initiatives that support women and their child's health and well-being. The search terms used in the 2021 bibliography were updated to kind of capture this nuance and, and focus in on the prevalence of alcohol use during pregnancy rather than the prevalence of FASD. Articles that are focused on the prevalence of FASD are captured in CAMFAST's list of um, top articles, which they also produce annually. So in light of these benefits and challenges with prevalence evidence, it's important to bolster this kind of research with uh, research on the influencing and contextual factors of alcohol use during pregnancy. So what did we find in the 2021 articles in terms of factors that influenced women's alcohol consumption? Um, so I'll walk you through a bit of a list of some of the factors we found. Um, we found factors related to mental health, substance use, and trauma that emerged in the research. Um, and depression especially appears to influence women's alcohol use during pregnancy. And this is something that we do see um, year after year in the annotated bibliographies. We also saw various kinds of relationships and relational factors as having important influences on women's use. Um, so as can be seen on the list here, partner's influence came up in a lot of different articles, as well as the influence of relatives and friends, household members, um, gender-based and intimate partner violence is an important factor to be considered. Um, and the knowledge and messages about harms continues to emerge as an important factor year after year. So the work being done to inform the public and encourage health providers to have conversations with women is still very relevant and important. We also see social determinants of health, such as age, education, income, race, housing, and geography as important influencing factors, as well as stigma and access to supports um, emerging as factors as well. So understanding these individual social, contextual, and environmental factors can help us at all levels of the four prevention for level prevention framework. Pairing prevalence estimates with a better understanding of why women are drinking during their pregnancy, we can then better focus on tailoring prevention efforts to different populations of women, depending on their needs and the local context.
So what did what we find from this process of compiling research in an annotated bibliography um, each year is that most re research is focused on prevalence and influences of alcohol use during pregnancy and brief interventions or level two prevention. And while this is important and informative work, there does need to be more research on specialized holistic support for women who have alcohol and other health and social problems or level three in the framework. We also need more research um, for supports for women in the postpartum period or level four. And it also reveals that there are opportunities for um, evaluating broad-based community prevention levels or research in level one. It's also important to remember um, that during 2021, researchers were greatly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and this may have affected what researchers could focus on. So for example, prevalence studies may have been more feasible to conduct than evaluations of interventions that require in-person attendance. And then finally, it's, it's promising to see that over the years of creating the annotated bibliographies, we are seeing more and more researchers incorporating and centering women's voices in their work. And this supports a more trauma-informed and um, approach to the research and can help us dismantle the stigmatization and, and give women an opportunity to voice what they need to be supported. So to summarize, um, the annual annotated bibliographies provide policymakers, practitioners, and researchers with current evidence. And what we find from doing these bibliographies is that research on FASD prevention is primarily focused on prevalence and influencing factors. And while this information can inform the four levels of the prevention framework, it also has its limitations in this endeavor. So thanks everyone for listening to my presentation. You can find the annotated bibliographies on the Center for, of Excellence for Women's Health website, as well as the CANVAS website. And the 2021 bibliography will be uploaded there in the coming weeks. So yeah, thanks again for listening and thank you to Dr. Kelly Harding and CANFAST for such a great opportunity um, to learn more about FASD research. Amazing, thank you so much, Ella. So um, I think we'll move on to our third presenter now, but just a reminder that we will have an open Q&A period again at the end. So if you think of any other questions um, for our first two speakers, please feel free to add those uh, as we go and just note who your question is for. So our third presenter today is Sarah Moss. Sarah is a graduate student in the Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology Program at the University of Guelph. Her research interests include understanding the offending trajectories of vulnerable individuals who are at risk of becoming or remaining involved with the criminal legal system. This has evolved to include examining how sexuality is understood in individuals with FASD. Sarah's presentation is titled Sexuality in Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder an important area of difficulty that is often characterized when describing the needs of people with FASD involves problems related to socially inappropriate sexual behavior. Despite early recognition of needs related to sexuality for people with FASD, empirical investigations in this area remain scarce. The current research project aims to identify the available literature on sexuality and FASD and identify gaps to facilitate future research. So Sarah, I'll pass things over to you. Thanks so much. Um, okay, hopefully this goes smoother than it did before. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so hi everyone. Um, thank you for being here with us today. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about sexuality and FASD. And I'm coming from the University of Guelph. So this is um, our land acknowledgement um, that we reside on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, and I wanted to give some acknowledgements to my advisor committee and collaborators. Just have to move this, there we go. Um, okay, so before I launch in, I just want to um, quickly cover that I'll be using the mouthful term uh, socially inappropriate sexual behavior throughout my presentation. And the reason for this is um, that this term free, um, provides a framework that emphasizes that the, so, the sexual behaviors themselves are not inherently problematic, but rather it's the contact, the context in which that the behaviors are occurring that views them as wrong. 
So oftentimes sexual behavior can be mislabeled as inappropriate or problematic when in fact the possible contributors to the behavior provide important insights into the diagnostic and management strategies um, that were um, under consideration. So for example, these contributors could be cognitive capacity, curiosity or impulsivity, so kind of personality uh, traits, what are known as atypical sexual interests or paraphilias. Um, contributors could be substance use and or difficulties with social interactions. So a whole uh, kind of range of um, things to consider and keep in mind um, as I go through my talk today. So turning back um, to FASD, socially inappropriate sexual behavior is often characterized as an area of difficulty for some people with FASD. We also hear it um, categorized or used as, a, um, as an example of a secondary disability or a functional manifestation of FASD. We see references to socially inappropriate sexual behavior in different diagnostic guidelines for FASD and broad review papers on the topic. Uh, we hear that it raises an area of concern uh, for caregivers of individuals with FASD and anecdotally raised by service providers as well. So with that, um, there's only been a small number of studies involving people with FASD in both clinical and criminal legal settings. And these studies report high rates of socially inappropriate sexual behavior. For example, studies surveying caregivers have reported between a quarter and a half of individuals with FASD engage in sexual behavior that they would describe as inappropriate. And we also see um, high rates of sexual abuse victimization or concerns around sexual exploitation or suggestibility um, in individuals with FASD, as well as um, a, the broader literature involving intellectual and other neurodevelopmental disabilities populations. So despite this early recognition of this area of difficulty, the research remains limited. So both, as I mentioned before, because there's a small number of studies that have been conducted, but within those studies, um, we feel that there are limitations in the methodology used and the focus of the research. For example, for example, studies may rely on caregiver reports, as I previously mentioned, rather than surveying the individuals themselves who have FASD. And so what we know is that when we uh, go directly to the source versus getting secondhand information, uh, you could get different pictures. And this is could be particularly true for topics uh, uh, like sexuality, where many of uh, the aspects of sexuality can be experienced internally and therefore may not be outwardly observable to other people. There also could be a level of shame or embarrassment um, or taboo around these aspects of sexuality that people may not be um, willing to share with another person. The current research also cites a wide range of socially inappropriate sexual behaviors, which suggests that different definitions have been used to measure sexuality in individuals with FASD. For example, some studies have examined physical and sexual abuse histories through one dichotomous yes-no question. So we don't actually know what the rates of sexual abuse are in isolation in this population. Other studies uh, ask about the presence of inappropriate or problematic sexual behavior without providing clear definitions. So it's up to the respondents to kind of define the term themselves when answering the question versus other studies may provide a whole list of examples that they would consider inappropriate or problematic um, to help respondents answer the question. And then as I've talked about so far, there tends to be this focus on the behavioral aspects of sexuality, especially those that contribute to interpersonal or legal difficulties without equal consideration of other facets excuse me, related to more healthy or normative or typical development and expression of sexuality more broadly. So we may be asking what are those other aspects? So if we turn to the definition of sexuality as provided or developed by the World Health Organization, we can see as I've highlighted in um, the first highlighted set of texts, um, we see those behaviors noted, but we also see some inter um, internal facets like thoughts and fantasies, attitudes, values, 
We see um, an interpersonal perspective coming into play in terms of roles that people may play in different situations, relationships as well. And then um, the latter part of the definition highlights this interaction of different factors that come into play when considering sexuality. So just as we talk about FASD being multifaceted, sexuality is multifaceted as well. It's more than just this behavioral expression that seems to be the focus of the literature and involves a complex interaction of many different factors. So we can say it's kind of a multi multifaceted uh, topic involving these two areas of research. So one way that we can um, try to guide our exploration of sexuality in FASD is turning to theoretical frameworks. So the first one that um, I'm going to discuss that we're using to guide this research is the biopsychosocial model. So this is defined as the, the influence of multiple biological, psychological, and social or cu cultural considerations and suggests that it's the interaction of these factors that not only contribute to differences in the severity of challenges that people may experience related to sexuality, but also this healthy sexual expression and experience as well. So some examples, uh oh, Okay, there we go. Um, so some examples pulling, pulled from the literature to kind of go through these three sets of factors um, are here on the slide. So in terms of the biological factors, we can look at research using preclinical or animal models, which show a teratogenic effect of prenatal ethanol exposure being associated with alterations in sexual development. So these can include decreased testosterone in males and delayed sexual maturation in females. If we look at the broader intellectual and other neurodevelopmental disability research, we see that caregivers have reported using hormonal or surgical management strategies as a way of managing sexuality. In terms of the psychological factors, I already mentioned these experiences of abuse and victimization, but we um, also hear reports of elevated rates for some people uh, related to substance misuse or poor mental health. And um, when we look at the literature outside of FASD, we see that these psychological factors have been associated with different aspects of sexuality, like sexual dysfunction, ex an excessive preoccupation with sexual fantasies, urges, or behaviors known as hypersexuality, as well as challenges with sexual intimacy. And then the, the um, social and cultural factors that could be relevant is, again, turning to that broader intellectual and other neurodevelopmental disability literature. There's this tendency to categorize individuals in the dichotomous fashion, either as being viewed as asexual or only engaging in sexual behavior that can be considered atypical or problematic. So either way, there's this framing of sexuality as taboo for these populations. So um, as you may be thinking, these examples that have been drawn from the literature are quite deficit focused and they don't recognize, as I mentioned a few times already, these opportunities for healthy and normative sexuality uh, in individuals with FASD. So the other theoretical, theoretical model um, that we're using um, in our examination of sexuality in FASD is a bioecological systems model. So this model proposes a dynamic and bi-directional interpersonal interaction uh, between the individuals and their environments. So there are four different levels that I'll quickly go through. The first one is microsystem. So the, this, these are, uh, this level is involves aspects of an individual's life that they interact with directly. So for example, um, how are individuals learning about sexuality? Is it formally like through sexual health education provided at school or at home, or is it informally through conversations with caregivers, siblings, and peers? The mesosystem is, involves the interactions between individuals' microsystems. So an example of this could be a child's caregiver sharing their perspective with their child's uh, teacher, regarding how, if and how sexual health and sexual education should be taught in the classroom. The exosystem involves informal and formal structures that indirectly include an individual through their microsystem. So an example of this is how sexuality is portrayed in the media consumed by an individual or what access they have to social services or healthcare that could impact their decisions around sexual behavior. 
So an example of this could be the cost of contraceptives or the access to contraceptives. And last, the chrono system involves the environmental changes that occur over one's lifetime and influence their development. So these could be governmental decisions and one um, topic of relevance uh, right now is like the legalization or access to abortion. So again, uh, when considering these examples across these two frameworks, some are specific to individuals with FASD, but others are meant to highlight the complexity of sexuality and the importance of considering different ways it can be conceptualized or where it may not have been um, in the current literature. So now turning to my present study, um, we know that there are gaps in the existing literature on sexuality and FASD. Hopefully I've convinced you of this um, by now. And we know that there are differences in if and how these various aspects of sexuality have been considered um, in FASD presently. We also know that socially inappropriate sexual behavior is an area of concern, but we don't really know what's being done in terms of management strategies to address these, this concern. So all of this suggests the need for a scoping review to provide a, whole, a fulsome understanding of sexuality in individuals with FASD. And you may be wondering why a scoping review when there are so many different types of reviews. And the reason for this is because it uh, can be useful as an emerging uh, research area. So these are my, uh, or our research questions that are being used to guide um, our review. So the first one is in whom has sexuality been studied in individuals with FASD and or uh, other relevant prenatal, sorry, preclinical animal models of prenatal ethanol exposure. Secondly, how has sexuality been conceptualized and measured in research focusing on FASD and what aspects of sexuality have been identified? Third, what risk and protective factors are associated with engaging in what we're considering more normative, um, typical sexuality compared to aspects of sexuality that would be considered more atypical or problematic or illegal? And fourth, what is known in published peer review literature about prevention, support, and intervention strategies addressing sexuality for community, clinical, correctional, and forensic FASD populations. So uh, in terms of the methodology we're using, um, we're conducting two parallel studies in order, sorry, searches in order to help categorize the human and the animal literature. We're doing this across six databases. Um, and we're currently reviewing relevant article titles pertaining to FASD and sexuality using an identified list of search terms that, have been that has been informed by relevant prior reviews in the FASD and in the sexuality fields. The title, abstracts, and full text sources are being screened by me, and we're using this uh, quality control tool for screening titles and abstracts um, by a second reviewer to, who reviews a subset of uh, the results. And then following the full text review, uh, data extraction from the sources identified as relevant are being um, pulled and entered into a standardized data extraction form using Covenant software and Excel. And so in terms of the implications of this research, first, um, we're hoping to get a greater understanding of terms of what's known about sexuality in individuals with FASD. Uh, across the different uh, domains, so community, clinical, correctional, and forensic, as well as what's known about the teratogenic effects of alcohol on the neurobiological processes that underpin uh, the experience and expression of sexuality. Second, we're hoping to describe the state of the field on important concepts that are related to sexuality and FASD and highlight gaps or limitations in the evidence base as opportunities for future research. And third, uh, we're striving to offer evidence-based insights that can inform and support professionals who work in sexuality and may encounter individuals with FASD in their practice, but also individuals who work in FASD who may encounter conversations or considerations of sexuality in their practice. And I just, there we go, I lost my cursor. So sexuality is a fundamental human right. It's recognized by the WHO and, a core, and is a core component of health and well-being. So it's essential that individuals with FASD are also considered within this narrative, both in an effort to reduce interpersonal or legal difficulties, as well as um, 
uh, sorry, difficulties as a result of socially inappropriate sexual behavior, but also to facilitate healthy sexual development. And so thank you so much for your attention. And um, that's all. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I see there's one more question for you, but I'll hold it for now until the open question period, just being mindful of time. So our fourth and final presenter today is Chantelle Ritter. Chantelle is a PhD candidate in the Psychology, Law, and Neurodevelopment Plan Research Group at the University of Guelph. Chantelle completed her Master of Science in School and Applied Child Psychology at the University of Calgary. Chantelle's research interests include the mental health and well being of children and adolescents with neurodevelopmental disorders, with particular focus in the criminal justice system context. Chantelle is passionate about research and clinical practice with children and youth that have experienced trauma and or have developmental disorders and complex forensic or mental health needs. Outside of research and clinical work, Chantelle enjoys plants, me too, hiking, crafting, and spending time with her loved ones. Chantelle's presentation is titled Evaluating Strengths and Protective Factors in Justice-Involved Youth with FASD. Chantelle will be presenting her dissertation research, which focuses on understanding the strengths and protective factors in justice-involved youth with FASD. Specifically, she was interested in investigating how strengths and protective factors can be cultivated and leveraged to promote positive outcomes for justice-involved youth with FASD. And so Chantelle, I will pass things over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'll just share my screen here. All right. So hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here talking to you all today. So as Kelly mentioned, um, my name is Chantelle, and I am a PhD candidate in the clinical psychology program at the University of Guelph. And I am speaking with you today from Guelph, Ontario. As Sarah just lovely, lovely mentioned, um, Guelph is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous um, history and is a home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people today. So today I just want to acknowledge the Mississauga, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation of the Anishinaabek peoples on whose traditional territory I reside. Today, I'll be speaking briefly about my doctoral program of research, which is conducted under the supervision of Dr. Caitlin McLaughlin. And my talk is titled Evaluating Strengths and Protective Factors in Justice Involved Youth with FASD. Broadly, here are the aims for my presentation today. I would like to start by briefly discussing the current deficit-focused narrative for justice-involved youth with FASD. Then I hope to quickly address some of the major limitations of this perspective. I'll then move into discussing the first study conducted as part of my dissertation, which is a scoping review of the literature. And I will then discuss where I hope to go with this research and why this is um, an important topic and my passion project. <clears throat> so we are all here today because we know, we work with, we live with, we care for, and we love someone with FASD. So I'm not going to spend any time talking about what FASD is, as I'm sure we are all very well aware. Um, and as you all know, FASD is highly stigmatized and often discussed in terms of deficits stru and struggles. So for instance, the current narrative is dominated by the discourse of mental health problems in FASD, physical health problems, and other neurodevelopmental impairments such as memory difficulties, impulse issues, um, processing speed, and all of that. This has been super helpful in the research um, to identify areas of need, create interventions, provide support, lobby for funding, all of those wonderful things. And this is where the story has primarily been focused in the research world. We often in the research come across negative outcomes such as um, justice involvement, missing school, poor performance in school, family stress, and all of those things. In particular, my program of research focuses on justice-involved youth with FASD, and this is what I'll be talking about today. To start us off, I'm just going to do a quick overview of some of the statistics we often hear um, regarding justice-involved youth with FASD. So broadly, research has estimated that the prevalence of individuals across the lifespan um, is somewhere between 10 to 36% of individuals with FASD that are involved in the uh, justice system. 
we also know through the research that they may encounter the justice system at an earlier age, so that being youth with FASD, accrue a higher number of charges and have a greater risk of reoffending upon release. The neurodevelopmental deficits that the research has shown um, so prominently over the past couple decades, uh, such as the Im impulse control issues, the executive functioning deficits, the learning disabilities, adaptive functioning, social skill difficulties, and then difficulties with judgment, decision making, understanding cause and effect, places youth with FASD at a higher risk of trouble with the law. Some estimates suggest that youth with FASD are 19 times more likely to become uh, justice involved than youth without the disability. Many outcome focused studies focus on the negative or poor outcomes of individuals with FASD, including justice involvement, um, but also behavioral issues sexual inappropriateness and often substance use school issues often show up in there as well. Again, these statistics and the research into the deficits and continuing that is so, so, so important. But I do, um, my program of research proposes that it's time to move forward and consider broad sort of well being and outcomes. So, as this quote lovely uh, states, um, an exclusive focus on deficits and negative experiences may also contribute to a sense of shame, victimization, and suffering, which may in turn add to the already profound stigma associated with FASD. And again, I think this is particularly relevant for justice involved youth with FASD, who are often viewed as most at risk for negative life outcomes, such as chronic justice system involvement. So what's missing with the current literature is that we know that individuals with FASD, even when they are justice involved in youth, can live healthy, meaningful, happy, productive lives. We need to consider the resources within individuals themselves, their relationships, such as their families, their schools, and their broader context to help promote positive outcomes. So currently in the literature, there's this shift that's starting to come about towards evaluating strengths and protective factors and considering individuals with FASD more holistically. So broadly in the youth justice literature and in the neurodevelopmental literature separately, um, there has been this kind of shift looking at strengths, protective factors, things that are going well, positive outcomes. And when we look at that together, it's kind of lagged behind a little bit and has really lagged behind in terms of FASD. Um, justice involved youth with FASD and their families are likely to particularly benefit from a greater emphasis on strengths-based research or more full picture research, um, as we know that there is high stress and stigma associated with that. And a really important note about this is that focusing on strengths and protective factors is not denying or minimizing the challenges that individuals and their families and their communities face when they're impacted by FASD, but rather emphasizing the need to pay equal attention to strengths, resources, successes to promote that overall well being. So um, as part one of my dissertation, I conducted a scoping review, which Sarah already just discussed, so that was helpful, um, looking at how strengths and what strengths and protective factors have been investigated for justice-involved youth with FASD. In particular, I had two research questions. So I was interested in whom and how have strengths and protective factors been measured in justice-involved youth with FASD, and also how have strengths and protective factors been conceptualized or defined in the literature, and what specific strengths and protective factors have been studied in this sample. So this is just my Prisma flow diagram. Um, there really wasn't that much out there. I'll go into the results a little bit in the next slide. But I searched a few databases. I only identified 96. Um, after duplicates were removed, irrelevant studies were excluded. I was um, left with 15 studies that were included in my review. So as I mentioned, the findings revealed a small number of studies that included strengths or protective factors for justice involved youth with FASD. Um, and many of the studies, which this is really important, did not emphasize or directly study strengths or protective factors, but rather mention these tangentially along with other findings. So for example, in one study that was talking about um, 
language and diversity, they used that as a strength, although that was not the intention of the study, it just came out. Um, the literature really lacked clear definitions of strengths and few studies used a relevant conceptual framework. And of note, only two studies included validated measurement tools. So this was the child and youth resiliency measure and also um, the SAVRI, which is a risk assessment tool. Other than that, uh, studies were primarily qualitative and again, strengths kind of came out accidentally per se and often were not the focus. Another thing that's really important to notice here is that a majority of the studies um, actually focused on adults or kind of, you know, people that have been living with FASD for longer and the youth was harder to find um, studies that focused on strengths. So some of the studies that are included in uh, this scoping review actually span a wider age range when I was really kind of capping it at, you know, a young adulthood, maybe 25. I included broader studies because many studies included individuals across the lifespan. So when we look at all of this taken together thus far, we really see not much clarity, not much conceptual definitions, no theoretical frameworks, um, and just not much research in this area. In examining what specific strengths and protective factors have been identified in the literature, I separated these across a bit of an ecological framework. So considering the individual, their relational or familial context, and then the broader context that they live in. Um, these are what came out through the scoping review. So individually, we see things like resilience, hope, some personal strengths that are mentioned, such as kindness, artistic, a love for animals, things like that, willingness to change and enculturation. When we go to the next level, we've got that familial or relational level. Um, we see that structure and supervision is a very important protective factor, support, stability and relationships and pro-social friendship, friendships. When we look broader at the community or contextual level, um, education and access to education or employment was really important uh, in promoting positive outcomes, support from other people, even broader relational people and early diagnoses were uh, a very important protective factor. So summing up some of that, um, strengths and protective factors were again, most often provided by caregivers um, Youth were occasionally asked in conjunction with their support persons, but there's really little to no research incorporating other perspectives such as just service providers, just caregivers, or just youth themselves asking about strengths in particular. The findings indicated a strong need for increased clarity when describing strengths and protective factors, and importantly to root these factors in conceptual frameworks to provide consistency and enhance understanding uh, to promote overall well-being and positive outcomes for this population. So this leads me to the second part of my dissertation, which I'm just going to be referring to as my broad program of study because um, this is underway currently. So Next steps in my dissertation, I really do um, want to understand the role of strengths and protective factors in informing positive outcomes for justice involved youth with FASD. And I want to do this by including a broad range of perspectives um, since that was a big gap in the literature. Specifically, I have two kind of parallel primary research questions. So first, I'm interested in how are healthier positive outcomes defined for justice involved youth with FASD within the system and beyond. I think this is really important. This was a huge gap. We don't really know in the literature what positive outcomes or success can look like. Next, I'm interested in what strengths and protective factors are present in justice involved youth with FASD, which ones are meaningful, how are they related to healthy outcomes and how have these been cultivated, leveraged and used in these populations to promote positive outcomes? Um, I'm hoping to recruit some parallel samples, likely a portion will be included in my dissertation and then the rest will be my broad programs um, of research. So I'm interested in service provider perspectives. I think that's an area that is largely neglected caregivers and of course youth themselves. Um, in particular, a big gap is that youth range. So, you know, 12 to 26 to 25, that sort of age range, um, which hasn't really been assessed uh, directly in the research. 
So currently I'm at the beginning of this arrow, but I am hoping to get ethics approval. Um, this is still underway, still working out some methodology. And then I'm hoping to get participants um, to contact me and then it will be um, a brief questionnaire and a qualitative interview. And then I will be using content and thematic analysis um, once I have the results of the interview. And the important stuff, why does this matter? So broadly, findings of this second kind of component and my program of study overall will really aim to provide conceptual definitions of strengths within this population and to help identify salient strengths, protective factors, and desired positive outcomes for youth with FASD who have been justice involved. Broadly, this work may provide important insights as to why it is crucial to include strengths and protective factors in our holistic understanding of this population. And hopefully this will contribute to a shared understanding of factors that can either prevent youth from getting into trouble with the law, lessen recidivism or promote desistance and just um, increase quality of life overall. Okay, so taking a step back, a broad, broad kind of conclusion for my overall program. Um, we know justice involved youth with FASD are particularly vulnerable and highly stigmatized. Often, and as the research shows, they are discussed in terms of negatives, deficits, needs. This is really important and has been important, but now I think we need to step back and paralleling other neurodevelopmental research or youth justice research, we need to consider positive strengths, things that lead to healthy outcomes. We know that youth with FASD that either are or have been justice involved can live healthy, happy, productive, meaningful lives. And really, I just want to better understand and evaluate strengths, protective factors. How do we use these? How do we promote positive outcomes in this population? Um, just a few quick acknowledgements. So I'd love to thank Dr. Kelly Harding and the Canada FASD Trainee Program. Uh, of course, Dr. McLaughlin and the Larger Plan Lab at the University of Guelph, my committee members, Dr. Margaret Lumley and Megan McMurtry, and then other Canada FASD research associates, such as Dr. Katie Flanagan and Dr. Jackie Pye, who have been supports in this uh, process. So if anyone is kind of interested in learning more about this, or once it gets up and running, my email is here. And I, um, yeah, again, I'm just very passionate about this, and I hope that we can see how important it is and I can answer some questions. So thank you all so much. So thank you all and have a fantastic weekend.